Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, today I'm going to be talking with Steve Collis from Amicus, and he's a learning space strategist. Um, is that correct? Yeah, that's it, Michael. Lovely to lovely to chat to you and your listeners. And yeah, that's that's probably a good descriptor. Um, we don't use the word strategist so much in schools. It's 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 um, it's probably a term used a bit more in the business world. But it ultimately strategy is about stopping and reflecting and thinking. Um, so that's always yeah been my passion is to stop and think what is what is a successful environment. Um, and so that's that's the work that I do. And then and, and then you turn that strategy into reality. You turn it into a, a classroom design, or you turn it into technologies. You turn it into pedagogies, etc. But you start by asking what matters, and that's what we what what I sort of mean by saying strategist. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're ready for um, for your twenty or so questions that I. Yeah. To you by email. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fire um, away. <laughs> first of all, yeah, you know, I want to just you know thank you again for this opportunity. Um, it's a opportunity for my for my listeners, for my subscribers, to be able to get an insight into how they can um, learn from from people like yourself in terms of classroom. Um, well, like, like I, I said. Uh, technology infused um, learning areas. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and that sort of really transforms into um, how they can effectively um, integrate technology across the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, so, let's get started. Um, so, welcome. How did you actually, how did you get started in? In well, how do you trans? What was your transition like between being a teacher um, to where you are now? Yeah, um, yeah. I'll give you the sort of the the brief version of my my story, uh, which is I I started as a teacher, um, a, a high school French and English literature teacher back in about two thousand and one. Uh, but I landed at a school that was small and was growing. We had about 250 kids. And over the next 10 years, we grew to about 1300. And what that meant is that we had to create new spaces as we grew. And um, I that we just had a new principal who had arrived at that school. The school was Northern Beaches Christian School, by the way, in Sydney. The principal was Stephen Harris. Um, and I, I had a strong affinity with, uh, with the principal because my opening experience at the school was teacher, 30 kids in rows of desks, yeah. facing the front <laughs> with no technology actually either. So the environment was fundamentally set up to have the kids do what I say, yeah. for me to push out the lesson plan, which was often a linear one step at a time lesson plan. Yeah. And so I very quickly as a new teacher uh, recognized that this was a, an environment that was very hard to succeed with because those 30 kids were all different to each other. They had different personalities. They had different attitudes to English or French or whatever they were trying to, you know, supposed to be learning, but they even had different moods on the day. And, you know, some were introverted and some were extroverted. You've got the kids who really need to be moving. They need to be physically moving to be engaged and to learn, um, which is quite natural. Like human beings were created to, to move. Like it's uh, evolutionarily speaking, we're movers. We And cognition and thought um, and movement are very closely um, associated. We often pay, I often pace when I'm thinking. But here I was in an environment where they weren't able to to move. Um, and so luckily the principal wanted to change that. And I very quickly recognized that that environment was completely broken. So over those 10 years, as we um, expanded the school, um, we slowly iteratively experimented with new sorts of environments. Um, and by that 2010, pretty much were unrecognizable from, from kindergarten through to year 12. And typically where we got to, I say, take took a decade to get there. Uh, but typically an environment there would have multiple teachers in one space with multiple cohorts of kids. 
um, tech everywhere, so laptops everywhere, screens everywhere, movable furniture, and all kinds of spaces. Some spaces which was, I have to emphasize this immediately, some spaces that were great for teacher talk, right, for teacher-led direct instruction, but then lots of spaces for hiding away and focusing, collaborative spaces, spaces you could bring together and break up again, and teams of teachers. So you go to the teacher who you like, or you go to the teacher whose explanations you understand, um, or you go to the teacher whose who's, who's lecture or, or direct presentation was at the right level for your understanding. And we had to develop all kinds of structures to make sure that all kind of work together. But 10 years of that, and, and schools started visiting us to come and see. Um, and that got to the point by about 2010, where there were so many school leadership teams who wanted to see what we were doing, um, that we needed to support them. So I went from an internal support uh, role to, um, to sort of um, helping other schools see what we landed on, and then, and then helping them with their visioning of what sort of environment they wanted to develop over time and how they wanted to include technology and how they wanted to think about their spaces. Uh, and how that was going to tie back to their pedagogy. So that's how I ended up going, actually, at the end of the day, I'm in strategy. This is strategy for great learning. Um, and so I got more and more involved with other schools um, to help them map what their future environment should be. Um, and then, look, the last chapter of my journey has been the last six years or so. I left schooling. and I now work um, primarily consulting to businesses as they think through their environments. Um, and what I discovered in that jump is businesses are asking exactly the same questions. So commercial companies, they're going, gosh, this factory style open plan office where everyone just sits in the same place and does what they're told by their manager, that's no good. That's going to drive us extinct. We've got to break that. So they're having exactly the same conversation as is happening in in schools around empowering people via the environment and breaking these very rigid environments to create something a bit more sophisticated and with higher autonomy and um, uh, yeah and flexibility. So yeah, in, in the last few years, I, I still do some school work, but I primarily do commercial work, and it's a lot of fun for me to compare the journeys of both worlds. So that's a long answer, but it's probably a good introduction to who oh, I am. No, no, that, that, that was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. That actually helps, you know. I think that probably answers my next question. Like um, I saw on your profile that you, know, you wrote that you did, you know, a number of innovations um, at the school. And so that's probably what you're, you're describing there, the different sort yeah. of innovations in, with the strategy. That's it. The, 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 and look, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing in 20, 2001. We sort of took, a, took it a year at a time and whatever worked, we did more of this. If anyone's interested, I wrote a I wrote a paper on this, and it got peer reviewed and published and everything, where I recount those ten years. Uh, but in addition, the principal did a PhD on the on the experience, and and recently Anne Nock has just published her thesis um, on the exact same school journey that um, that I went on. But yeah, it was a uh, what we did, and I guess this is probably good to to frame for this conversation is we continually asked ourselves what do we want to see happening for the kids? That was the question. What do we want to see happening? Well, we want to see little Johnny, you know, or whoever the kid is, loving their learning and taking initiative and being quite entrepreneurial about, about problem solving. Okay, we want that. Therefore, what can we do with the learning environment that is going to make that more likely to occur? And so we're constantly reverse engineering from the the, ex the experience of learning that we want to be normative for the kids and then enabling that in the environment itself. And so when we say the environment, then that could be as simple as, I don't know, removing a few desks so that there's room to move around the classroom and you can have a bit of physical movement. It could be getting laptops or getting Wi-Fi or, some, or, or getting an LMS to sort of or using, you know, back back in those days where, you know, flipped learning was a completely new thing. And it's it's um, far more well known now. But the idea that you could just record the teacher doing a presentation and then let the kids access that on a phone. That's, an, that's a tweak to the environment. But then think of pedagogy and, and the teachers, the teachers, um, you know, what teachers do is they kind of create a set of rules or a set of rhythms that go with the environment. And we very much played with that. 
So things like permission to stand up and move, um, uh, the idea of having two teachers in an environment, um, that's what we ended up doing in high school is just let's pair up two classes at a time. And then what that allowed is one teacher at one end of the classroom could be doing the direct instruction. But as soon as the kids figured out that they understood the material, mm -hmm. they could move to the other side of the learning environment yep. and start um, driving their own activities or getting on with the work, so to speak, with another teacher available to help. So um, that was another technique where you're just saying, let's be more sophisticated about the teachers who are available and how they're deploying their attention. Uh, so there's a whole range of like tweaks to the to the environment and how it ran. And we just stumbled on stuff that worked and then whatever worked, we did more of. And then after 10 years of that, you know, um, you know, you, you had the winners, the winning ideas embedded across the school. Awesome. But I think definitely the direction that we kept coming back to was flexibility. And, and, and the reason why is you come back to it, kids are at different points on their journey. They need different things at different points. Yeah. And, and that's why tech was our ally because um, technology was able to enable kids to get on with ideas and, and to be very empowered. Um, and in, in many ways, until, until technology became, um, got to its current point, um, you either had to rely on a textbook or you had to rely on the chalkboard. You know, there wasn't any other information to be found. It was the teacher, yeah. teacher or the textbook. But now, well, you know, once you start getting to a one-to-one -one program or you get some even not that, even just some, uh, um, some, some, you know, iPods or something that are available. Suddenly, the teacher is no longer the sole owner of information, and, and we found that very exciting. And I still think that's very exciting. Um, moving on to uh, a bit more about Amicus, um, the website mentions um, that you have a an education strategy um how does that sort of how does it involve the design of the 21st century classrooms these days so yeah so and, and to contextualize that um amicus has been designing classrooms for a while but um offering a um a strategic visioning piece first is a newer offering from us and it's got a lot to do with me Having, having come over to the business world, I'm now wanting to straddle both worlds. So, so the last year or two, we've begun offering um, this sort of strategic work with schools. And probably an example I would give um, to understand what that involves would be St. Luke's Marsden Park in Sydney, where we ran um, workshops for um, uh, to, to help guide their new learning hub. Now, we didn't even end up designing that new learning hub but I supported them in that initial strategy work. And what that looks like um, is getting a range of people in a room, first of all. So um, uh, we got a range of teachers who were going to be um, involved in that learning hub and some leaders who would then help um, drive the vision for that learning hub. And this was, you know, uh, um, what otherwise you would call a library space, but has evolved into something that's massively multi-purpose and, and is like a, um, a shared space that that's, the classes across the whole school could come and use. And what we do is we, we start off thinking in terms of personas. And so the idea of persona mapping is you say, who does this space need to work for? Well, this space needs to work for teachers who are looking for resources. This space needs to work for kids, but actually different sorts of kids, kids who are young. Actually, we, we discovered that where you know the the younger earlier primary age kids who are coming into the space they're going to have a different set of needs and a different set of experiences than i don't know the year 10 robotics kids who are coming in and so we started segmenting that as a team and going well here if we were to summarize it here are the four persona groups that this space really needs to cater for and for each of those personas here are some scenarios that are going to need to work for those people um, so, for instance, um, some of the high senior kids running their own makerspace type projects and being able to put them up on display with minimum of um, effort. Um, for some of the other teachers, the ability to have line of sight to the kids wherever they are in the space while still allowing them to be flexible. So we do that mapping 
And then we say, okay, if, if those are the personas who we want to thrive in this space, and if these are the, some of the, the scenarios, they're sort of the, the learning experiences that we want to promote in the space, then therefore, what will we need to get right in terms of the physical space design, in terms of the, terms of the technologies that are there, mm. and in terms of the, um, uh, I, I referred to this before as pedagogy, but really it's ex more expensive than that. It's the, the set of understandings yep. that people will bring into that space. Um, and so we mapped all of that and it was things like flexible spaces, but display spaces as well. Um, spaces that were able to be decommissioned or commissioned by kids. So, you know, you set up a space and you say, we can assign this to a group of kids and, uh, and say, look, within parameters, this is your space to reconfigure. And so it was mapping all of that and, um, and into, you know, and various techn technological uh, things there, such as tech uh, available to be grabbed on demand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really then we're setting the parameters of that space. So then off the back of that work, I know St. Luke's has taken that strategic work and has then um, yeah, moved forward with implementing that with a designer, interior designer, with, with, their, with their technology program, but also with an internal program to say, this is how the space works. This is how you can use it. This is the rules of engagement. Um, and just on that last one, there was a, there a couple of really promising ideas there. They had um, one of the personas was local experts in the community coming in. So maybe it's a marketing expert or a, um, a financial planner, you know, maybe parents of the community, but not, not restricted to that. They can come into this learning hub and then be available to tutor or to support the kids who are doing their, their entrepreneurial projects in there. So we needed mechanisms for that to work. Um, and um, uh, what was the other one? Um, there, were, there were other sort of rules of engagement that we had to put in place as well. So that this, this space, it's not just designing the environment, it's designing the, the rhythms of the environment and the permissions of that environment so that it's actually going to hold together really well. And so that's an example of the work that I've done recently. Okay. Um, as schools and classrooms continue to become more technology driven as a consequence of, um, of a society that is technology integrated um, with, with, with um, work and lifestyles, mm -hmm. Um, what are the similarities these days that you do see in the workplace and in classrooms? Yeah, so the, the two, those two environments are, are evolving in parallel, but, but generally people are either in one world or another. And I've had a lot of fun being able to straddle those two worlds. Uh, but let's say technology rich, a typical company now, um, they would run a little social media um, channel called Yammer is often one of the most popular ones. It's a Microsoft product. So it's a bit like Facebook. Um, and then the other one is Microsoft Teams. Um, and it's very normal for people to be chatting to each other via text message, posting, you know, posting messages on these social boards. Um, and so it doesn't matter even where, where you are physically, especially since COVID, half the workforce is at home. Yeah, often have workplaces distributed between um, multiple locations across Australia and beyond. And so they interact in this virtual space. And what they have to do in that virtual space is make sense of complex information. <laughs> so companies often now work on a matrix organization, ch organizational chart. They don't just have a manager. They have multiple reporting lines. They have to reconfigure their teams quite dynamically. Um, to figure out what they're wanting to do. And by the way, I think I now just have to move room. So I'll, um, I'll just step out of this space even while we're talking, Michael, and I'll- Another right? Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, you oh, go right cool. in. <laughs> so let me just reposition over here. Is the, um, is the audio okay then, Michael? All good. Okay. So um, uh, needing to juggle computing pro. Oh yeah, am I okay? Yeah, yeah. Is that audio still okay, Michael? Yeah, yes it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I was sort of in a, in the commercial world, juggling um, information coming at them from multiple directions, and then often collaborating 
um, in the cloud. So one team member will start a PowerPoint or something like that or Google Slides, yeah. but it's in the cloud. And so simultaneously, someone in Queensland is typing into the same report that's due tomorrow as someone in New South Wales. Yeah. And then they jump on a call. And so um, when we think about some of the technologies that um, are in the classroom, you know, um, the idea of chat channels running in the classroom, mm. yeah. why not? Yeah. Why not have the kids yeah. help each other? Why not have them collaboratively create a presentation live? Um, that's what the workplace looks like. And this, um, this question around, is the teacher directing? Right, to what degree is the teacher directing? Now, we all need structure. So we all need um, some support by a leader who will help shepherd us. Um, but the truth is in a workplace environment, um, you look at, at any job advertisement, they will be asking for people who are self-starters, who can figure out their own priorities, set their own agenda, don't need to be told. And the reason for that is any kind of job that can be done by a machine is being done by a machine or being offshored. Mm. And so every company I talk to is talking about how do we attract people who can be a bit entrepreneurial and a bit. And so when we think about technology infused environments, actually, you know, a technology infused environment ultimately empowers the learner to take initiative to, to construct their own learning. That is exactly what someone in the workplace has to do from moment to moment. Um, if they're going to thrive, if they're going to, if they're going to um, yeah, be useful in the workplace, this is very normal. There are process jobs, right, where you just repeat the same process, but they're getting fewer and far between. They're not well paid and they're really vulnerable being, to being automated. Yeah, that, that sounds so true, Steve. Like, and to me, like um, the what struck me then was how you said, how you described, you know, the, the connection there between, you know, the two in, environments um, and, and really, um, you know, when we talk about uh, today, you know, um, in schools integrating technology across the curriculum, um, that's pretty much, you know, we are, we are talking about preparing students for 21st century works, workplace. Um, and so integrating, integrating technology across the curriculum, um, you know, has striking similarities, you know, to what's happening now in the workplace, as you know, as, as more workplaces are becoming more technology infused, you know, and people communicating through Teams and and you know email and just the general use of technology in the working environment there. So you know, yeah, that is that's a great point you made. Um, bring me to my next question. How do you and I? Take a, quick, a, um, a bit of a, uh, a quote from the website again. How do you marry real world pedagogical experience with real world design with reference to the use of technology driven pedagogies implemented in classroom practices? Yeah, I think the way to do that, um, it's through this idea of scenario planning. Um, so you, you figure out who your personas are. Um, you know, you might, if a teacher is listening to this and they're thinking, how do I how do I evolve my learning environment? I don't, you know, it doesn't mean redesigning a whole classroom. It might mean shifting furniture or using some tech tools that are already at your hand, setting up some new um, lesson approaches and that sort of thing. So let's let's keep this. Um, I'm just trying to think of a of a contained practical example. And what you do is you go, well, who are my personas? I've got those kids over there who are a bit disengaged, and I want them to be more enthusiastic. I want I've got that kid over there who's blitzing everything, but um, you know, I'm, I'm scared that they're hitting a ceiling. Those kids over there need to be moving to learning. So you do some of that um, persona mapping and then think through what would, a, what would the best lesson in the world be for each of those groups and do a little story. So tell a little story of, um, you know, the best lesson ever and, and Turn, and the way to do that story is in a series of moments. So um, 
you go something like, um, uh, I know that Lucy engages with learning when she feels relationally connected with the teacher. So for her, it's around feeling like the teacher's on her side, the teacher's got her back, the teacher understands her, the teacher is supportive, and it's all about that emotion of that connection. So therefore, her perfect lesson would be would kick off with a moment of, of relational connection with the teacher, maybe a quick word about her weekend or a check-in about her re how her recess was. And then the very next thing that would, would work for Lucy is um, and then you and so you sequence out these moments into a story now you do that with each of your personas and now you've got a cluster of moments that um, that are showing success across that um, across that um, uh, those, across your people who you're trying to engage across your learners um, and it can be quite overwhelming to do this exercise the first time you do it you might end up with um, 20 or 30 moments for, um, across all the personas. But, but you can then whittle them down and say, actually, my successful, if I was to have a more successful learning environment, I would know it was more successful because Lucy would get a little bit more of those um, supportive connections. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Johnny over there would have more chance to move while he was learning. And so you, you might rank them as the sort of the top five moments that I want to see more of over the next month of my learning in my learning environment. And so this is real world. So this is what, what we mean by real world. It's very anchored in what we know needs to happen um, in a in a classroom. Um, and so then you go from that to say, well, how can I shift the environment to make those moments happen more regularly? And an example, if I go with technology, um, an information technology might be, I don't know. So this may not be appropriate, it just depends on the classroom and the teacher and the kids, right? So I'm just speculating here, but you could say, let's shift some of the, um, let, let's shift some of the burden of framing up the lesson from me as the teacher to some kind of technological tool. It could be that they log on and they go to a wiki and the wiki's got today's notes or it's got the options or um, there's an interactive portal that maps the whole week out. And we do a bit of framing on Monday so that they know what's going to happen throughout the week. But then we say, then in terms of the rhythm of the learning environment, we say, hey, actually, um, when you come in, come in, consult that map and then you know, and then you know what you need to do. And now, by the way, that means that I, I've got a bit more time as a teacher to focus on Lucy as she comes in. And it also means that uh, uh, Johnny over there who needs to move doesn't have to have the first five minutes of the lesson being sat down, told to pay attention to me, the teacher. So I'm using technology to kind of free up some new moments that can happen for Lucy and for Johnny. Um, and, you know, um, I'd recommend experimenting with this. So you could just say, we're going to try that just on a Monday morning or just on Friday after lunch and see what, what, what um, combinations of tech, use of technology, of using, use of those pedagogies or shared understandings and, and of changing the physical space, see what they, see what works. I know, um, I know Michael, one of your other questions is going to, is going to be, but what if you're on a budget? What if you what if you don't have much resourcing, for instance? And I can tell the story of a teacher who, yeah, um, went solo on this. Um, a teacher at a, at a government school, um, I think um, from memory in, in Parramatta um, in Sydney and whose story I followed. She came to a workshop of mine many years ago and um, she just enlisted the parents she, she, she engaged with her, her kids, first of all, to figure out what, what, the, what ideas they had for the environment. And then she engaged with the parents of the kids and they ended up getting some, um, some blackboard paint from one of the, one of the parents was, um, oh, pardon me, sorry, I'm. <laughs> you still there? Still there? Kind of lost you there, <laughs> Steve. You there? Yeah. All right. Am I back? You're back. 
I'm back. Sorry about that. I, I literally just knocked the laptop uh, keyboard up and it closed the system down. Um, yeah, um, one of you know one of their parents, one of the parents um, was a bit of a handyman. Had some blackboard paint. They came and they turned one of the walls of this classroom into a giant blackboard. Mm -hmm. And so actually, a blackboard is an ICT. It is. Mm -hmm. It's an information technology. It may not need electricity, um, but now they had a situation where. 10 or 15 of those kids in that class could be publicly displaying their thoughts on this massive physical wiki all simultaneously. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other, other ideas. Some involve technology, some involve things like putting plants on the, bringing in a bit of greenery and a bit of rearranging of the furniture, but not buying any new furniture. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so huge things were able to be achieved, but it started with stopping and thinking, what do we value? And then, and then clothing the environment, yeah, building an environment that was more going to support what they what they wanted to see happen. Um, the website, the Amicus website, displays an extensive list of schools where you have worked. Um, without making reference to the school itself, what examples can you talk about how you transformed and changed their learning environments towards a more technology? orientated and pedagogy learning style? Yeah, so um, there, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, and I often, often from where my focus um, was, was the, the vital missing piece of the teachers themselves. <laughs> so in, um, you know, who, who actually were going to make the environment work. Um, and so there was, I'll give you two examples. One was a, um, a school just on the other side of the Blue Mountains in Sydney. Um, and we collapsed their staff for two days. And, and we just um, started in teams, looking at the possibilities, walking around the school, um, coming up with ideas and then launching projects to make that happen. And the principal supported that. And you know, part of what came out of that was activating the corridors. The corridors were dead space, but they were quite large. And they put, ended up putting lounges there and, and reading nooks, etc. Um, another another one was a school in Wagga. Um, actually, I can tell you the name of that school. It was it was some years ago. It's Matter Day School there under the principalship of Greg Miller, and they were launching a combined program for Year Seven uh, for Year Seven called the TED program, and they were combining cross curricular um, teacher teams. Um, and collapsing the timetable. They already had a space, but it was around bringing the technology and the pedagogy now to, to make that work. And for, for them, um, really, I'm a facilitator. So I'm, I'm not solving for people. I'm often helping people come to see a shared picture. And for that team, it was hugely around um, getting the teachers planning together. Um, and that was the big, really the big, outcome for that environment and creating options with the technology you know so some people would present you know using video and some people would present using you know, powerpoint and other information tools but some people would be pre would present um, just using audio and some would be using posters and low low technology mechanisms and it was for them it was around creating an environment that has options the right options so that you start thinking of technology as a set of tools and you go to the right tool at the right time for the purpose that you're, you're going for. So for that school, if they were doing a, an environmental report, they might wanna use one tool, but if what they're wanting to do is um, persuade a group, they might go for another tool. And, if, and actually if the project involves entertaining or fundraising, they might go for another tool. So it was around having a technology with the right options and the kids trained in the right options so that they can, they can use the tools that they need when they need to use them. They, that, that's a couple of examples, but um, I often I often have acted as a catalyst, but to get the teachers thinking together and coming up with a with a great plan for, for that sort of thing. Yeah. I suppose your your background as a teacher has helped you a lot in that sort of area as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And ultimately, um, this is why you see this real world language come together a lot. Is um, environments often um, get driven by architects and school leaders, but I've always come at these um, environments from the perspective of a teacher. You know, you know you're know, you there Monday morning, 9 a.m., how is this gonna work? 
Um, and, uh, you know, you need a, you still need a space where the teacher can direct instruction to, to kids and to, can, can hold the kids as a leader. Um, but you also, there's so much more you can do um, around that, but you, so much of it ends up being solved at the point of planning. So you don't just create an environment and then it hums, you need a plan. And especially if you're collapsing classes together and having multiple teachers in there, you need a plan. Who's doing what and what are the rules of engagement and, you know, how does this map to the curriculum? Um, so I, I still come, come at environments from that practitioner um, mindset. Mm. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you've been called a, by amicus, <laughs> again, uh, a change leader. Um, change is significant in education and is often synonymous with leading a digital school. Um, you've, yeah, like, as I said, you've been given the role of the strategic change leader at amicus. How important is that is that for change to occur in schools in terms of transformation and readiness for 21st century student-centered learning? Yeah, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. So yeah, that change role is referring to my support of organizations, schools and, and, um, and businesses. I do both. And it's supporting, um, supporting the transformation journey. And um, typically, the, the problem that needs to be solved here is there's some leaders who, who catch a vision and everybody else is left behind. <laughs> so, and the solution to that, uh, I'll try to be really succinct here, the solution here is to co-create the vision in the first place. So everybody gets involved, parents should get involved in creating the picture of the future, that, that transformative picture. But then everybody should be involved in making it. And that's what I saw happen at this school where I was at for 10 years is we didn't transform overnight, we took 10 years, but at every step of the way, the teachers were creating and then deploying that vision. Um, so um, I think that's the trick with, with a change journey is um, I, I, heard, I heard someone say it recently this way, nobody, people don't mind change, they just don't want to be changed. So you, you just can't force change on anyone. None of us like that. You've got to be part of it. You've got to create the change and um, yourself. And that's that's always where I go to is helping um, everyone in a school, which means the kids, it means the teachers, it means the parents and, and others um, create the change themselves so that they're actually the authors of the change. In your experience, Steve, um, have you ever encountered... Uh, any sort of resistance to to the change that's happened, any transformations that's happened in, in schools that you've done? Or yeah, absolutely. We and and ultimately we are creatures, human beings um, um, are wired not for change but for stability. And I think that's an evolutionary thing. And I think the fact as soon as you change something, you might break something that was working. And as soon as you change something, you it requires much, much more energy um, because what was working previously took less energy because we did it all the time. So there's good reasons for change resistance and people who are particularly change resistant often have got very good reasons for it. They've got, you know, they, they've got good points. So I think, um, I think you have to embrace the resistance and say, yeah, let's look at what, what are those points of that of resistance. Um, and then um, create solutions with people who are more resistant to the change. But people aren't so resistant when they're creating the solution. That's what I'd come back to. People are resistant when someone else pushes a change that they've thought about, but nobody else has thought about. So yeah, I've, I, I'm not nervous about change resistance. I think it has to be embraced. It's a strength and it's natural. And so you have to work with that energy. There's always a point where people have just become stubborn. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the exception. I, I don't. I think when you start engaging people and asking, well, what do you want to see happen in future? It starts unleashing a really positive energy. So yeah. um, that's that's how I'd approach that. Yeah. No, I would happen to agree with you there, Steve. Like um, as you said, you know, people do become resistant to change when it's pushed upon them. But if they are part of the solution. Um, themselves and have a you know have a 
um, somehow involved in in um, you know what's happening in have a say. Um, I think um, from my experience, what I've um, studied and read about a lot, um, many of those successful schools that have transformed into a more digital school, um, they involved a lot of these staff in the whole process um, from, from the ground up, you know, what do we need, um, you know, to, you know, what, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, how can we build in that, you know, what are the pedagogies we can put in place um, and then follow through. So I do agree with what you were saying there that, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the one danger here, right, is we don't want people to just copy and paste what they've seen do in the past. So the, te the, the antidote to that is to get out of the current environment and go see other environments. Um, and so if I was thinking about a great change technique that's going to, it's going to work for anyone, right? Someone who is quite, they, at first blush, they sound quite resistant, which by, yeah, which I think we're all saying on this call is that that's actually not true, is people, people come from a good place. And so we, we shouldn't just say that they're resistant, um, but, but, but um, get them out of their current environment and go see some other schools or what we've often done in the past is go to see some non Go see workplaces, see how workplaces are currently functioning. Go see a museum or, a, you know, go see places where kids are paying to go on the weekend and say, well, what, what's, what's happening in this environment that could be relevant back to our environment? And so what school A could get, just go and visit school B, you're bound to come back with really cool ideas. What are they doing with technology? And then you get a chance to ask those teachers, well, how is this working? And how did you solve this problem, that problem? And suddenly people who are who've got some resistance, they've got natural resistance, but they're finding the solutions to those problems just by getting out of their little fish pond and going to other fish ponds. Um, change also needs to be sustainable for schools and classrooms. In what way do, you, do, you, do your classroom infrastructure sustain learning through and with technology? Well, I think... I, this is my personal reaction to that question is I'm a long-term kind of guy. And what I saw happen really great at that school where I started is it took a decade. So I'm a big believer in persistence. Um, so I think we underestimate, we overestimate what can be achieved in a few months, a year, um, but we underestimate what can be achieved over five to 10 years. So I think you've got to have a long-term plan and be really stubborn about pursuing it in the long term. So, you know, I, Whereas I'm not so excited about a school making a huge, a huge big deal around such and such a project that's launching next year. Don't tell me about that one project. Aim to grow projects everywhere, but then keep doing that over years and years and years because you'll find what works and you'll get somewhere. But um, what we don't want is these sudden hype cycles, which then uh, die a death. So I think there's some, just something there around thinking in the long term and being really persistent about the vision. Um, in relation to the types of collaborative designs that, that, you, that um, Amicus does, the, in, the integration of ICT in classrooms these days promotes collaborative activities um, across the curriculum. How do you ensure in classroom de designs these days that students can, can collaborate together around technology to achieve learning outcomes? So I think there's an integration piece here between three, three work streams. You go physical design, the technology design, and then the pedagogy or those expectations design. And typically from a strategic point of view, what you try to do is say, well, um, we know what we need to get right in these three streams. Um, and so once you've got to that future vision, the way to implement this in a way that's gonna work is you, you create a project implementation team that represents all three teams. So if you're redesigning a learning space at a physical level, that, that designer should be sitting alongside a technologist, right? So someone who can wire up the technology or check or do the Wi-Fi or, or um, the, the ICT integrator or um, who's gonna help 
figure out the pedagogy of that technology. And then they should be sitting right up close to the teachers themselves. So these different groups have got to stay coordinated for that environment to end up being successful. Otherwise, you're going to have a physical space that um, doesn't match the technology. There's nowhere to store the laptops or the, the AV setup isn't right and the wires everywhere or the Wi-Fi isn't configured properly. Or you've got all of those things right, but the teachers are sitting there going, I don't know, how, I don't know what to do in this environment. So to me, it's, it's about synchronizing those three streams. And that just takes, that's why you do strategy is at the start, you say, here's what we're going to set out to do. And from now on, we're going to keep meeting. So you have to keep meeting and continually realigning the project so that that, that final environment or that, that next version of the environment gets those ticks in the boxes. Yeah. Um you might have already touched on this a little bit um, before, but what similar what similarities do you see in uh, cross learning spaces design ideas? Like from um, if you have done work, you know, um, with um, early childhood, or primary education, secondary, even tertiary. Do you see any similarities in the way that yeah. they like yeah, their I, designs? Yeah, and what I keep on saying is that as a society, we're moving from factory to ecology. That's what mm -hmm. I keep saying. From, from, from this industrial factory mentality in our spaces through mm -hmm. to a more dynamic choice-filled environment that is empowering for its inhabitants. Yeah. And you see that in early childhood, actually, already. Like early childhood are the leaders of this. Um, and, you know, an early childhood environment will allow people to, to move and to touch stuff and to make stuff and to interact quite freely. Well, that's where workplaces are heading. They're heading towards, um, they're often called activity-based work environments um, or flexible work environments. And that's the direction, especially since COVID. Since COVID, you've got people saying, I'm sometimes in the office, I'm sometimes at home. So it becomes especially flexible. Um, and I see, I think you see that direction in primary to a lesser degree high school. Definitely you see that direction back in university. So it's it's a move from static, fixed, rigid environments to, to uh, environments that are more flexible. They have options um, and they're more changeable over time. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the shared direction wherever you look. Um, the website on Abacus um, mentions that you did some work for um, the Good Start Learning, Early Learning um, uh, headquarters. Um, can you recall what were the key features they requested, even, even though it was just the headquarters? I mean, I'm sure that the... Um, that they, they might actually have wanted to um, you know, emulate those sort of features in their own learning centers as well. What were those key features that they wanted sort of thing? Yeah, so um, you, you did right. <laughs> they, um, um, they, you know, we, we wanted to recognize that a workplace isn't exactly the same as, a, as an early learning center, but that people are the same and there's certain people propositions that should be consistent um and and so there were there were from i'm just going from memory there was a direction around playfulness and play and and kind of wanting to keep that childlike spirit in the space but um the, the big one i think it was around flexibility it's exactly what i was saying before is people are at their best when they have choices where the environment matches what they're trying to achieve at the time and in the same way as we would want a learning center to have a variety of spaces and a variety of capabilities, that's what we want in the way we work. Um, and so they moved towards a far more flexible, uh, far more flexible, a far less rigid um, work environment um, in that project. Um, yeah, but, but this is a theme that um, I'm hearing every day in company leadership teams anyway. But good start, we're uh, miles ahead of the pack because they got it. You know, everybody, everybody on that project was already tuned into how good an early learning environment can be, and so why not extend those lessons to a workplace? Yep. Um, if you don't mind me asking, have you done any um, 
uh, well, have you offered any strategies for any early learning centers or? Um, not in my life at Amicus. So I've worked with early learning centers um, previous to coming to Amicus, but it's work that I'd love to return to. So if any of your listeners are interested in the chat, I'd love to, I'd love to pick that up. Um, I think I've learned a lot from early childhood educators. As a high school trained teacher um, in my work, I learned a lot from primary teachers and then I learned a lot from early primary teachers, but more than anything, I learned from early childhood teachers. And I've, I'm, I've yet to go into an early learning center and not had my socks blown off by what's already happening there, to be honest. One of the things that like, um, cause I've, I continue to do study into, uh, how they can use technology in early learning centers across the um, across their curriculum is they make it a, a very good point that um, that if you're going to have technology that you shouldn't have have a place in just one corner of the room. Um, can you? sort of add to that and say, well, we are, what, you know, how would you be able to strategize and be able to create a, a learning environment? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think um, I, don't, I don't tend to think in specialist terms, you know, in the 80s, you had your computer room, right? <laughs> um, but, but that shouldn't be the case now. You're much better off having the technology baked in, make it anywhere, anytime, make, you know, if you've only got 20 computers and 80 kids, we'll spread them out so that someone who needs a computer right now can access it. Um, so I definitely support that um, approach. Um, but actually, apart from saying that, um, Michael, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump off the call because I've just realised we've had such a good chat that we've gone right up to the hour and I'm supposed to be in a client meeting right now. So even though I know that's not your actual last question, um, but if it's okay, um, maybe we round that off then. I'm happy to do a part two another time if you'd like to. Sure. Um, but thanks so much for having me and, and I hope that that's been helpful to your listeners. If they want to um, chat to me, they'd be most welcome to. Oh, absolutely. My here. It's been my pleasure and thank you so much for the opportunity. So we've got a okay, you're welcome, Michael. Go well. Bye-bye then. 40 minutes.